All right. We're looking at page 21. We're just going to spend 20 minutes um, or so on the notes, and then we're going to move to the interviews. Um, and you guys are staying right here. Um, Dan, Pastor Dan, and um, Scott Tramer are going to probably go next door to the office. Just it's not going to be private uh, or quiet in the library. That seemed ironic, not quiet in the library. Just go next door. So, um, so we're going to try and stop around 9, 905 for that. Um, but we're on page 21. We kind of complete this uh, 4E um, strategy where we began with engaging and we come out to evangelizing, but it doesn't really complete a process. It's a process that is to continue. Um, but the um, phrase that we use around here often is we gather to go. And so the engaging part is the gathering, and the evangelizing part is the going. So we gather on Sunday mornings for the purpose of establishing, equipping, and going, um, not just so we can gather the next week. Um, it's not to be just that. There is a, that isn't to be the end. Um, and so the evangelizing piece of the four E's is, is, um, is to go. We have to go. We're going to look at that. Here in a moment, we come to Matthew 28. But before we do, on page 21, um, there's three characteristics that bear witness for the unbelieving world that we are his followers. First one in John 13 um, is love. Let me grab that one. I'm not going to look up every single verse here, but I do want to grab this one. John 13, um, 34. Jesus said, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Here's the key here, verse 35. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Um, so uh, part of our strategy for evangelism is we love one another. Uh, simple in, in concept, difficult in practice. Uh, but it shows the world that we're the church um, and we're being the church uh, by showing our love for one another. So we have to look for ways uh, in which to do that. Um, and, and as we'll see here, um, also the unity is, is, is coming up as, as well. But the world's watching to see how well we get along with each other. John 15, 8 um, is fruitfulness, another characteristic um, uh, to the unbelieving world is fruitfulness. John 15, verse 8 uh, says, This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So there it is again. Um, how do we show that we're his disciples? We love one another. How do we show that we're his disciples? There's, we bear fruit. Um, so there ought to be fruitfulness, um, which is, is just um, the church being visible, a uh, visible presence of Christ in the world. As we're remaining in him, what, the, what comes out of that is the presence of Christ. And that's what they're seeing. So they ought to see transformation in us. They ought to see evidence of the fruit of the Spirit. They ought to see our good deeds. They ought to see hope, as 1 Peter 3.15 says, you know, um, set apart Christ as, as Lord, um, and, and that people, as we do that, will ask for the reason for the hope that lies within us, and we can speak to that with gentleness and respect. Um, and so we have to be the visible presence of Christ in the world by our fruit, by our fruit. And then John 17, 20 through 23, um, staying in John here, the word is unity, unity. Jesus prays uh, beyond just his disciples. He prays for all believers. He says, my prayer is not for them alone, meaning just the disciples. I pray also for those who believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. And you see the word one over and over here. I in them and you in me, may they be brought to complete unity. Why? To let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. As we talk about evangelism, um, we got to have these three components. No sense going out preaching, no sense going out into the world and, and sending them tracts and, and doing all those other things if we're not carrying out these um, very vital characteristics of love, unity, and fruitfulness. Now, around this, I just kind of go on a slight tangent, if you'll allow me to do that, and it's spelled out here in your notes. Because when we talk about unity, what do we mean by unity? Um, and so I just spend uh, a little time here, um, and really, um, this is, this, we could do a lot of classes just on this one subject. 
I'm going to try and break it down to the bottom line here. But a distinction should be made between what is essential and what are non-essentials for fellowship and cooperation. Distinction should be made between what is essential and what are non-essentials for fellowship and cooperation. Chrysostom said, unity in things necessary, liberty in things unnecessary, charity and all. And, and that's been said many different ways. Um, but um, there ought to be unity. Um, and, and when we talk about unity, we're going to spell some of this out. And so when it comes to essentials, such as the deity of Christ and, and, and salvation by faith alone and the inerrancy of, inerrancy of scripture, um, resurrection of, of believers, uh, virgin birth, uh, we as a church could not participate or partner with, might be a better, better phrase, partner with or join um, with a movement, organization, or church institution that would not agree with the essentials of the faith. This is biblical separation. This is biblical separation. Um, and so we draw a line there in terms of partnership. Now, some non-essentials, such as the premillennial return of Christ, or immersion, I just grabbed two, um, as a mode for water baptism, should not come between two believers when it comes to fellowship and cooperation. And so we have to make a distinction. There are some things we can say, we're going to have to agree to disagree, but we can partner with you because you believe in, in, in the same that we do in terms of deity of Christ and, and by faith alone in Christ, uh, and so on and so forth. And so we can line up with that. Um, and so there is a biblical separation. There's also an unbiblical separation. I'm not going to get into all that, um, in which people keep drawing lines all the way over here so that you are separate from anybody who disagrees with you and, and with anyone who disagrees you know, with somebody you disagree with, and on it goes. And it just, the line gets really, really dark all the way out. I'm not talking about that. But in the context of non essentials, Romans 15 gives us divine guideline on page 22. Uh, for how we are to treat one another even though we disagree. It says accept one another then just as Christ accepted you. Um, and so perhaps you have specific areas of living in which you cannot in full conscience participate. It's not legalism to have such personal standards. If you cannot, you should not because Romans 14, 23 says everything that does not come from faith is sin. But we must be careful not to impose on others these personal standards that are not clear in God's word. Um, and so Romans 14, that we're not going to dig in, we did in a class back a ways, looked at Romans 14 over cla two classes. I'm not going to really get into it, but Romans 14 is the key passage on what do we do with those who um, uh, don't agree with maybe our convictions on some gray areas. And they're gray for us and not gray for God. Okay? He lives in a black and white world. We don't. And so at times we have to kind of say, okay, this is my conviction on this matter. And you're going to hold to that. Now, when you start imposing that on other, every other people, when it's not a clear uh, violation of God's word, and you say, no, I believe you shouldn't do this on a Sunday, and you should believe the same way, then you violated Romans 14. Equally would be if someone's trying to talk you into going along with um, what they are free to do. So if they're free to do something and you are not, Romans 14 clearly says, uh, back off. Back off. Leave the person alone. Let them live out their conviction. Their God is their master, not you. And so if we start to say, what's your problem here? So you can do this. You can, you can do this on Sunday. You can have a drink. You can go see this movie. And you start, and the person, nah, that's my conviction. No, I can't. What, that's ridiculous. Come on and do it. Now you're causing them to stumble. And Romans 14 uh, tells you not to do that. And so the first passage here, when we are talking about uh, gray areas, we need to ask five questions. The first one is, will it cause a brother to stumble? Will it cause a brother to stumble? What that means is, you cause them in their weakness to do something that violates their conscience. Okay? We can't be the professional weaker brother uh, in which we throw everything in on the table. Um, you know, I don't like the way you dress, so you need to change that. You're causing me to stumble. I don't like the way, you know, whatever, the way you, you, you know, comb your hair. Um, and so you need to change that because it causes me to stumble. That's ridiculous. That's the place of absurdity. No, no, no. Stumble means you cause them in their weakness to do something that violates their conscience. Okay? So if you remove everything that someone didn't like in their preference, you couldn't do anything. You couldn't even drive in this morning. I mean. So, will it cause a brother to stumble is a good question to ask just the same. Secondly, should it be surrendered 
for the greater good? Should it be surrendered for the greater good? And I'm not looking at all these passages because of time. Um, I invite you to do that. Um, but should it be surrendered for the greater good? There's some things we say I'm going to give up for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of Christ. And it's not worth it for me to dig in on this because uh, the gospel is bigger than this issue. And I'm going to surrender it. So we need to ask that about some gray areas. If I guess one question, should it, will it cause a brother to stumble? Should it be surrendered for the greater good? Is it beneficial? Is it beneficial? First Corinthians 6.12 gives us two principles. One is, is it beneficial? You might be able to do it, but it is beneficial to your life to continue to do it. And another fair question to ask is, is there a real risk I may become mastered by it? I may become mastered by it. Because if that's the case, then you should get rid of it. Even though you say, I can't do this. But because of my personality, or because of my past, or because of whatever it might be, I can't continue in this because it's going to master me instead of I mastering it. So I really need to let go of it. So it's not worth it to put myself at risk there. So there are things in which we have to say, gray area might be okay for you, not okay and cool for me, because um, it's going to allow, it's, I'm going to be mastered by it. And can I do this in faith? Can I do this in faith? Romans 14, 23, everything does not come from faith to sin. So those are five questions. So I kind of go on this tangent a little bit here, but a necessary one. Really wish I could develop it some more, um, but for the scope and the purpose of our class, I'm not going to. Um, but it's all around unity, because what is unity? Unity doesn't mean we're going to agree on everything. We have to agree to disagree at times. There's going to be certain convictions that you hold that um, I don't particularly hold. Um, it's not a clear command of Scripture. It's not a violation of Scripture. Um, you're, free to, you're free maybe to do or not to, and maybe vice versa. And we have to be okay with that. We have to be okay with that. All right. I'm going to look at this Matthew 28 passage, but any questions on that? Beneficial or mastered? Mastered. Mastered. M A S T E R D. Mastered. Enslaved. All right, so as we talk about we gather to go, there's three characteristics that ought to be a part of who we are as a church love, fruitfulness, unity. Um, and also as we talk about evangelism, um, we uh, uh, are talking about this command right here, Matthew 28, to make disciples. And that's for all people. And so Matthew 28, you've seen it, you're familiar with it, I, I recognize that. Sometimes in the familiar, um, we kind of just go click, um, but stay engaged in the ear as we look at this again. Um, Matthew 28, 18 said, Jesus came to them, his disciples, and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And so, there are three um, important actions here. There's uh, going. There's baptizing, and there's teaching. So there's three actions, um, because as you've probably heard, um, if you've been around uh, others who have taught on this verse at all, it's, it's not therefore go as if there's a point in a destination you go to that place. It's as you're going. It's going, baptizing, teaching. They're all in the present tense carrying it out um, in that way. So, so there's three important actions here, going, baptizing, teaching. And then um, there's one command that we have here, and it's make disciples. The two qualifiers of baptizing and teaching. 
thematically, this is how this passage works itself out. So you have three actions, going, baptizing, teaching. There's one command here. It's make disciples. That's at the center. It's the main command. Everything else um, revolves, revolves around it. The two qualifiers to make disciples are baptizing and teaching. And when it says, speaks of baptizing, it's just talking about identification. Um, it's, making, it's a public witness. And teaching um, were to be lifelong um, learners and taught to obey. And so in order to make disciples, as we're making disciples, we're to baptize, help them to identify with the church, identify with Christ. That's the whole idea of baptizing. And then the teaching would help people to understand what it is they're to obey. What does God's word say about? Um, that's making disciples. So it didn't say make converts. It says make disciples. So, um, key passage, obviously, um, to this last E of evangelizing is right there. We gather to go. Now, in Acts 1 8, uh, another key passage here is three spheres of influence are to be our Jerusalem, our Judea and Samaria, and then the ends of the earth. And all to happen simultaneously. Um, we're, we're not to say, well, let's get it all worked out here locally. Uh, in our Jerusalem, Laconia area. Um, and, then, and then once we get that all worked out and we really evangelize and make disciples there, then we go to the next one, Judea and Samaria, which is Belknap County or all New Hampshire, if you want to look at it that way. And then we go to the ends of the earth. We go outside of, uh, of our, our state, outside of our country. And we then do it. But we have to do these two first. It's not what it's saying. Simultaneously, we're doing these three, three spheres. Because we'll never get around to the third one if we just wait till we do this one all, you know, get this one all right. So all ought to be happening. And it's the, so it's the, to the ends of the earth. So, we, so if we break these down, the ends of the earth, we have a responsibility to reach all nations, the ends of the earth. We do this by, by a calling to go through support um, of missionaries financially and through prayer. Uh, we do this through short-term mission trips, the ends of the earth. We get outside of ourselves here. Uh, Judea and Samaria, as we reach the surrounding area for the purpose of making disciples. And sometimes that's through parachurch ministries. There's other ministries that are carrying out what we're not able to carry out. Um, and so we line, align ourselves with them if we can partner with them in the essentials and we're okay with that and what they stand for. And we can, uh, we can, you know, since duplicating it, we come alongside of them and they, they become the kind of the arms of the church as we not only support them, but we try and and um, you know, give them help along the way, maybe resources of people, and so on. And that's why you see different ministries here, whether it's um, Aspire, which used to be Care Net, um, or Love Inc., uh, fill in the blank. There's just several um, that we help with that locally can do that job. So that's part of reaching our Judea and Samaria. And our Jerusalem is we want to be right locally more intentional about reaching on those in our neighborhood. How are we doing that? How are we doing that as a church? Well, as I'm speaking to Jerusalem and locally, how are we doing that as a church? Two things we're kind of focusing on. One is servant evangelism. Um, being the church requires that we um, make Christ's presence known to the community through acts of kindness. Um, and, and we're really trying to get that moving as we become the hands for the community. But it's not just doing a good deed, it's doing a good deed in the name of Christ. And it's doing a good deed with the hopes of sharing the gospel with them. So there's plenty of people and maybe churches and organizations that are doing maybe the good deeds and we can learn from them. Uh, and maybe they got that part, but the gospel never seems to come into it. And so it's just like, what a nice church. They really do a lot of kind deeds. Okay. It's not bad to have that reputation, but it's got to point this way. It's got to go to, why am I doing this? doing this for the glory of God. I'm doing this because Christ's love compels me. I'm doing this because Christ saved me. I'm doing this because I love him. Eventually, we've got to get there. And so we say servant evangelism. It is about going around to neighborhoods and say, hey, you know, we're going to rake your leaves today. But we're going to tell you why we rake your leaves today. We rake your leaves because of, of Christ. And hopefully that opens up doors of conversation. And so we're really trying to get this movement. Um, and get on the stick on that one. But the other way that's always going to be um, a very much part of our DNA 
is would it be missional and intentional? And what I mean by that, I think I spelled it out here, dude, yeah. We're to invest in the people God has placed in our network of relationships. And so every person's responsibility is to be Christ to their neighbors, to be Christ to their contacts, to be Christ and the people they cross paths with every single day. And so it's not about bring them in, you know, kind of the, the, the big fisherman up front, me, reels them in, and you just bring them here. It's about us going out from here, we gather to go. We go out from here, and we, in our relationships, we're hoping to share Christ with them. And then maybe bring them in, and bring them in is fine. The mentality or mindset is not, if I can just get to the church, then Pastor Brian can you know, get saved from up front, is really not from here. Sounds good, but most people have a better chance of really getting into that life than I ever will because you have a relationship with them. You have regular contact with them. And I have people I have contact with that I wouldn't say, hey, you know, come on, Jeff, I got a buddy over here that I've been, you know, at the, going to the gym with, whatever, can you go share the gospel with them? It's not how it works. It's not how it works. So we have our network. We're to be about sharing Christ with the people that God's placed in our path. And so we're gonna constantly talk about um, sharing Christ that way. It's been said that research shows that 72% of um, Americans do not know their next door neighbor. About two. And especially New England. You know, we get property that's away from everybody else and privacy, and I get it. But we do that so that I don't really want to know that person over there. I want to be separate from the individual. I, I want my space. We have to watch that. We have to watch that. So there's ways in which we need to um, get to know our neighbors. And uh, we're hoping even get to know our neighbors here by doing a block party um, next spring. Which is great idea even on an individual basis. We did it in Portland every year for many years. And it was a great connecting point with the unbelievers in our neighborhood. It was fantastic. Who doesn't like a block party? I was a little intimidated first at Pastor Bryant's whole block party. They didn't know what that meant. Once I got past that, we were good. Who doesn't like a block party? So anyway, there's things we can do uh, with, with, with people around us. Uh, and so as leaders, uh, we want to encourage people at EBC to be missional, uh, to build relationships with unbelievers, and, to, and we want to equip people to do this. And so we might even have a class in the fall, not sure yet, still working on it, um, on um, maybe apologetics or just being equipped to share the gospel, I'm not sure. Uh, but at some point we will, uh, because we need to be doing the equipping as well. And the equipping comes not only in Sunday, it comes Sunday morning from the pulpit, comes in maybe settings like this, uh, but there's also very um, uh, intentional, intensive times in which we can equip people for sharing the gospel. Because most people are intimidated by that. It's like, hmm, what if they ask that million dollar question? I can't answer. So we stay away from it. All right. I don't know if you wrote down any questions, if you're cheap back here, the next page is blank. Then, you know, we're gonna be done here. I do wanna draw your attention to the appendix on page 25 and 26. I don't spend time on this, um, but um, what you have there on page 25 and 26, um, you know, an area of, of difference um, is uh, the appendix, is the uh, return of Christ. Um, and, uh, and, and, and you know, Lord's return and what all that means. And it was never meant to divide. It was meant to motivate. And so the focus, if you want to focus anywhere, focus on the points of agreement among, among evangelicals. Those are the things we ought to be focusing on. And sometimes we spend a lot of time and a lot of classes, a lot of teaching on all these other areas of disagreement and, um, and, and for what? It ought to lead to, we eagerly long for his return. While we wait, we serve faithfully. We don't know when it's going to come, even come today. All right. So I, don't, I just don't spend time on that because it's not teaching, it's not doctrine kind of class where we give everything that we could about every subject. But I want to at least put it in there so you know there are disagreements on that. You probably do 